Thanks so much for coming. It's late in the year and it's, uh, and it's rainy. The, um, the rain is a good thing because this is spring fling and it will keep down, it will suppress the boisterous <laughs> spirits. There was an event some years back um, uh, uh, when I was chairing the English department. Um, there was a, uh, did I introduce myself? I'm Jim English, <laughs> if anyone doesn't know me. Uh, when I was chairing the English department um, years ago, a colleague of mine died, a uh, very unhappy event uh, in the middle of the year, and we scheduled a memorial service, big production. We had more than 200 people were there. We had music, we had a professional harp, harpist. He's a, a music lover, and um, it was really, it was quite a, a lovely event in the end, but as we were setting up for it, it turned out to be on this same Friday of Spring Flink, and we were in Houston Hall, and just outside the windows, they were setting up for an undergraduate concert at the same time. Not the big concert, but a pretty big concert on Perelman uh, on the quad. And so, sorry. Um, so, uh, so anyway, it was almost a catastrophe, but we were able to get them to just push back their schedule a little bit, and we concluded before they began. Um, anyway, it's Fling weekend, but we'll have, I hope, a, uh, a fling of our own here. I wanted to say a couple of words about the, uh, the Digital Humanities Forum, which is the, um, the lead sponsor of this event. Uh, this really is the last um, public event. We have a, uh, a co-sponsored conference uh, coming up uh, next, next week um, that's been organized by the German department. That may be flashing through here occasionally. Um, but, uh, but as we come to the end of the term, this is the end also of the, of the Digital Humanities Forum which is now giving way to the Price Lab in Digital Humanities, which is the new center for digital humanities that's being, uh, being launched with a gift that uh, Dean Kahlberg and, uh, and others in SAS worked to, um, uh, to, to coax out of um, our, our friend and alum, Michael Price. Uh, we have uh, quite a generous gift from him of $7 million, and, uh, and we've also recently been awarded a Mellon grant of $2 million over four years. Uh, half of that is already uh, in hand um, here on campus. So the, uh, while the actual physical space, the Price Lab, will not be fully constructed and habitable uh, for, I would say, 24 or 30 months, um, perhaps, um, nonetheless, the, the physical space is not uh, everything that's understood by the Price Lab for Digital Humanities, but rather it will be a building out of many of the things that we've started doing under the Digital Humanities Forum um, rubric. And these will include opportunities for faculty, for students and un undergraduates and graduates, um, seminars and workshops, new curriculum, uh, funds for course development, um, a graduate certification program, and, uh, and a number of other, of other things. Postdoctoral fellows will be brought in. Uh, all of this is done um, in tandem uh, by SAS, in, in, in tandem with its partners in the library, uh, the inventors of digital humanities, as we were discussing the other day, and the Penn Museum. And the Penn Museum also uh, is a, a sponsor of this event uh, here today with us. So many thanks to, uh, to our friends in the museum, uh, also to, uh, to our, our partners over in the library, a number of whom are here, are here today. Uh, the format for our, uh, for our event is going to be um, that we will have both of our presenters um, speak, um, and then we will open up to a general conversation, Q&A, um, about their presentations, their work uh, individually, but also I hope we'll be able to have maybe a more um, uh, a more wide-ranging uh, conversation, or at least one that attempts to articulate um, the different kinds of research that they're doing in the sound archives um, with, uh, with each other. Uh, so this will go until about noon. We then have lunch for everyone uh, who wants to stay for that and a chance to, um, to mingle more informally and talk with each other and with our, with our presenters. So that said, I will introduce um, Patrick Feaster, and Tanya Clement. Patrick is preservation specialist in the, uh, the, the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative at Indiana University Bloomington. He's just been telling me about the scale of that initiative and it's really impressive. Uh, his scholarly training includes a doctorate in folklore, uh, 
and uh, ethnomusicology from Bloomington uh, with his 2012 book, uh, a book and CD uh, package, Pictures of Sound, 1,000 Years of Educed Audio, 980 to 1980. He's credited with redefining and resetting the terms for the entire field of historical audio. Uh, he writes a blog about historical media more generally called uh, griffinage.com. Um, you should take a look at that if you want to find um, amazing posts on all kinds of historical media projects, including his use of uh, face averaging to track the rise of say cheese smiles in American photographs, which is really, is really cool. And it's, it's like the 1930s, sort of, is that the turn point? Yeah. Um, he didn't use to smile, right? Uh, Dr. Feaster is currently president of the Association for Recorded Sound Collections, um, and uh, maybe um, most Im impressive of all to a mere academic like myself, he's received three Grammy Award nominations. So, um, and, and, uh, and Patrick will be our first speaker. And then Tanya Clement will, will follow. Tanya is an assistant professor in the School of Information at UT Austin and a member of the affiliate, affiliated faculty there in the English department. She holds an MFA and a PhD in English from uh, the University of Virginia at Charlottesville where she worked on Gertrude Stein and digital modernism under the direction of Matt Kirschenbaum. The, uh, the, the brilliant theorist of media forensics. Before moving to Texas, she was uh, for a year or two at the uh, Maryland Institute for Technology and Humanities, MIT, where she worked on a, uh, a project called MONK. What is it about these digital projects that these uh, uh, acronyms proliferate so aggressively? Um, the MONK project, which is what metadata offer new knowledge, which is a big million dollar um, project out of uh, Maryland and, and Virginia. Um, Tanya has published extremely widely in the field of digital humanities. She's collaborated on a host of research and software development projects, creative exhibitions, virtual exhibitions, and more. Uh, she's been PI on several uh, NEH-funded grants, including the, uh, the current project, High Performance Sound Technology for Analysis and Scholarship. There's another one, HIPSTAS, which uh, she'll be talking to us about uh, this morning. Um, and that project also has involved some collaboration of our group uh, here, Penn Sound. Um, so uh, I see Chris Mastaza and others who, who are uh, connected with that. Um, anyway, that's I think enough by way of introduction. So we'll start with Patrick, then Tanya, and then we'll have a general conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about some work that I and a few other people have been doing to bring to life the oldest audio in the world, which we can listen to today. This audio doesn't come from anything the average person would, would recognize as a sound recording. We're dealing here not with CDs or audio cassettes or LPs or even wax phonograph cylinders, but with paper documents that look rather more like graphs or drawings. These pictures of sound were originally created to be seen rather than heard. There was no intention that they would be played automatically as sound. No understanding in most cases that they could be played automatically as sound. But that's what we've been doing with them. And when I talk about subversive digital eduction, that's the subversive part, exploiting historical documents in ways their creators never expected to gain insights and experiences their creators didn't mean to give us, subverting their intentions. The digital part refers to the fact that we're translating the sources into audio digitally, which is what ties our work to the digital humanities. But I want to start today by explaining what it is I mean by eduction, because I'm using that term in a somewhat unconventional way to refer to a concept that lies at the center of the work I'm going to describe. The Oxford English Dictionary defines the verb educe as to bring out, elicit, develop from a condition of latent rudimentary, or merely potential existence. I first start, started using the words eduction and educe myself around 10 years ago to refer to the process which audio speakers use to create sound. Now this process is usually called reproduction, but I found that misleading for a few reasons. Uh, first, the audio that comes out of speakers is sometimes synthetic or heavily edited. Uh, consider the chipmunks or electronic dance music in which case it can't be said to reproduce any pre-existing sonic reality. Second, uh, 
even when the sounds that come out of an audio system are recognizably like the sounds that went into it, they don't necessarily function culturally as a reproduction of those sounds. Take the typical telephone answering machine message, I'm not here right now. Uh, treating that as a reproduction of something someone said at a previous moment in time kind of defeats the purpose, misses the point. Uh, third, sound vibrations passing through the air have a three-dimensional complexity that microphones can't pick up and speakers can't duplicate. So in that sense, audio technologies never really reproduce voices any more holistically than photography reproduces people's faces. So I wanted to write and talk about sounds mediated by loudspeakers without taking for granted that these were ipso facto reproduced sounds. So I turned to the language of eduction as a neutral alternative. Maybe the sounds coming from a speaker correspond to some prior sonic reality, or maybe they don't. But those sounds are invariably being brought out from a condition of latent existence, from a record groove, say, or an electric signal. I had sound media in mind when I first started using this language, but I also recognized that other media required eduction as well. Uh, think about what a movie projector does with a film, for instance, or what a TV does with a TV signal. And in fact, I'd argue that all inscriptions need to be adduced in some way to make their content meaningfully perceptible to our senses. Even just to read a book, I need to open it and expose its pages to the light in a particular sequence and at an amenable pace. That's what I mean by eduction. Taking an inscription and doing whatever we need to do to deliver its content to our senses in a meaningful way, whether that's holding it near a lamp, or playing it through headphones, or pulling it up on a computer screen. Digital eduction simply entails doing this sort of thing with digital technologies, something that often enables us to present the content of inscriptions in meaningful ways that would be a lot more cumbersome and less accessible if we try to achieve them through non-digital means. In a moment, I'll share some examples of historical documents being adduced as sound so that we can hear them. But first, I'd like to set the stage by showing you a few comparable cases of visual eduction. The phenakistoscope introduced during the first half of the 19th century was the first known animation device to rely on rapidly displayed image sequences. Uh, back in the day, a phenakistoscope disc with narrow, evenly spaced slits could be held facing a mirror and spun while the viewer looked through the slits at the disc's reflection, as you see here in the top image. The slits would expose the reflection for a split second each time the disc rotated a step forward in the image sequence, making the images appear to swap out for one another and producing an illusion of movement. But today we can achieve the same effect digitally. Below you see an animation of an image sequence from Edward Muybridge's descriptive zoopraxography of 1893. There are 14 images spaced evenly about the circle, so for each successive frame in my animation, I've just rotated the image counterclockwise by 1 14th of 360 degrees. I didn't need any specially designed equipment like a phenakistoscope to do this. I just used Photoshop. And the results can easily be posted online and displayed effectively through any ordinary web browser. In this case, the images were intended for animation originally, so the illusion I'm contriving from them remains consistent with their original purpose. However, the same technique also lets us animate much older inscriptions that represent changes in visual appearance over time, but were never intended to be animated. Here, for instance, you see two charts showing phases of the moon dating from the 13th and 15th centuries. By displaying them this way, I'm certainly not realizing they're too true purpose for the first time or anything like that. Uh, these charts were definitely intended for viewing as still images and they serve a perfectly good purpose that way. But if we display them as animations today, we can experience them differently and that gives us an opportunity to understand them a little differently as well. Uh, granted, I'm not sure we gain a lot of insight from these two examples apart from demonstrating that there was enough continuity in Western European conventions for depicting motion over time for medieval moon phase charts to satisfy the technical requirements of a 19th century animation technique. But let's consider these two copies of a chart of the Cursus Solis et Lunae per Signa Singula, course of the sun and moon through single signs. <laughs> 
from manuscripts of the early 9th century. We could study these charts for hours and hours in static form, comparing the images in an effort to figure out the changes over time they're trying to represent. Or we can animate them to gain a comparable impression immediately and a lot more vividly. It might take some knowledge of medieval astronomical theory to understand just what we're seeing here. But the point I want to make is that creative modes of deduction have the potential to help us access, understand, and experience the content of historical inscriptions in ways that are meaningful and analytically useful, whether we're dealing with medieval astronomical charts or early specimens of motion sequence photography. Different modes of deduction offer different insights. Depending on what you want to know, the static view or the animated view might be more beneficial, or perhaps there's an advantage to having both available side by side. Here's another example of a document that poses some challenges when it comes to deduction. A stereo view of an alligator published around 1870. Now you can compare the two images side by side for as long as you like, but their real value lies in their ability taken together to produce an illusion of three-dimensionality. I know some people train themselves to cross their eyes as needed to perceive a three-dimensional illusion from a stereo view without using any special equipment. Can anyone in here do that? Okay, a couple. I'm, I'm not very good at it myself. Uh, now, stereo views were originally intended to be viewed with a stereoscope that presented one image to the left eye, one image to the right eye. But this isn't particularly useful when it comes to, say, displaying stereo views online or to an audience like this one. One strategy people sometimes use to display stereo views online is to convert them into anaglyphs, like this. But viewing these in 3D requires red cyan glasses. Does anyone in here have a pair of red cyan glasses handy? <clears throat> then this probably isn't going to be very helpful. Uh, another popular approach to displaying stereo views online is the so-called wiggle GIF, an animated GIF that alternates rapidly between the left and right images. This yields a sense of three-dimensionality by simulating what you'd see by jerking your head rapidly from side to side. It's attractive because it doesn't require online viewers to use any special equipment, but the effect is also rather uh, dizzying. Uh, it gives me a headache to look at them. Don't know about you. Here's an alternative approach I came up with. Instead of simply alternating rapidly between the two images, I fade more gradually between them. That lets us cut down on the wiggle rate making the viewing experience, I think, a bit more comfortable. Or, instead of just fading between the images, we can use readily available image morphing software to morph seamlessly from one image to the other. This technique's more subjective and time-consuming than the others. In this case, I had to define about 100 individual reference points. But the illusion is even more convincing. The point I want to make is that there isn't any single right way to induce a source like this one, any more than there's a single right way to interpret it. At the same time, some approaches may be more historically accurate, more accessible, more informative, more compelling, more convenient, or more suitable for particular situations than others. So, I've touched on a few cases of historical documents being adduced as video, but what's involved in adducing historical documents as audio? Here's an image created in 1874 for use as a magic lantern slide to illustrate what an audio waveform is. Let's set it into rotation. Now, if we display just a tiny portion of the trace through a slit, we see the movement the waveform is intended to represent, albeit in slow motion. The changing position of a particle as it oscillates back and forth in connection with sound vibrations. Here you see the movement being displayed as a visible animation. But if we instead impart the same movement to the membrane of an audio speaker, that movement will cause compressions and rarefactions in the adjacent air, thereby producing an audible sound wave. I call this tympanic adduction to distinguish it from other kinds of adduction because it relies on the motions of a membrane or tympanum. Of course, there are traditional methods available for inducing waveforms as sound equivalent to the phenakistoscope and stereoscope we saw earlier. Here's a picture of a gramophone, circa 1890, the direct ancestor of today's turntables. During recording, which would have happened on a different machine, 
Sound vibrations caused a membrane at the end of a funnel to move back and forth, tracing a wavy line on a rotating disc. After processing, that wavy line became an etched groove capable of guiding a needle back and forth as the disc rotated on a machine like this one, causing the attached membrane to impart a sound wave to the air. Today, we often achieve the same effect through digital means. The information can be stored as digital samples instead of in a physical analog of a waveform, and it can control the sound producing movements of a speaker electrically rather than mechanically. In many cases, digitizing an older analog sound recording is relatively straightforward. We can play it on appropriate equipment, such as a modern turntable or a tape deck, and digitize the resulting electrical signal. But what do we do if a sound recording exists in a form that isn't playable in that way? One that exists, for example, only as an image on a piece of paper. Here's a case in point. A paper print of a gramophone disc from the year 1889 found in a scrapbook in the papers of gramophone inventor Emil Berliner at the Library of Congress. As you can see in the close-up image on the right, the same kind of information we associate with sound recordings is there, but we can't very well play something like this on a turntable. Fortunately, we don't need to. We just need to find some way of converting that waveform into a playable digital sound file. There are a few ways this can be accomplished, but here's what I do in a case like this one. I start with a high-resolution flatbed scan of the source image, uh, usually 2,400 dots per inch. Invert it into a bright trace on a dark background, if necessary. Convert it from a spiral into a set of straight lines, if necessary. This is just a polar to rectangular coordinates transform in Photoshop. Cut out the individual traces one by one into narrow strips and join them end to end. Uh, that's step one in this chart. Uh, then for step two, I erase any extraneous marks surrounding the trace and join any breaks in the trace. That's the, the time consuming part. Uh, a bit like retouching a photograph. It can take hours and hours and hours. Then for steps three and four, I fill the top and bottom of the image in with white respectively. Uh, then in step five, I use a piece of software called Image to Sound to convert the total brightness of each column of pixels into an audio sample, with the top filled image feeding into the left channel of a stereo file and the bottom filled image feeding into the right channel. Then in step six, I sum the two channels to mono. The result is a playable wave file corresponding to the waveform in the source image. Here's the opening section of that print from 1889 in Emil Berliner's scrapbook at the Library of Congress. I've provided a transcription of the German text as deciphered from the recording by Stefan Puy, Norman Bruderhofer, and myself, with an English translation on the right. The voice you'll be hearing is that of Emil Berliner himself. The details of Berliner's collaboration with Louis Rosenthal are poorly documented. So the informational content of this recording is somewhat valuable, quite apart from the fact that it's being conveyed to us as spoken language. Here's another excerpt from the same print, which I think you'll all be able to appreciate without a translation. That last part was Reuters Morgenlied, 
the oldest known surviving recording of singing in the German language. The recent drive to recover sound from 19th century recordings on paper can be traced back to the founding of the first sounds initiative in 2007 by the four people you see here. That's me on the left, then David Giovannoni, and then Megan Hennessy and Richard Martin of Archeophone Records. At the time, we had just finished work on a CD called Actionable Offenses, Indecent Phonograph Recordings from the 1890s, a critically annotated compilation of the oldest known surviving smut recordings, which had to be strategically bleeped when they were played on NPR. Uh, we'd enjoyed working on that CD and wanted to find some other worthy project to take on together. And one idea that came up was to track down the world's oldest surviving sound recordings and try to make them talk and sing. Uh, now we knew that Thomas Edison had been the first person to record and play back a sound in 1877. But we also knew that Edison hadn't been the first person to record a sound out of the air. Uh, that honor goes to Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville, a French proofreader who had invented the phonautograph in the 1850s, an instrument that worked much like the gramophone we considered earlier, except that it traced its wavy line onto a sheet of soot blackened paper wrapped around a rotating cylinder and then stopped there. The goal was to produce a waveform that could be studied visually and not to play it back afterwards. That much was already pretty widely known back in 2007. However, the only published examples of phonautograms at that point looked like these, split-second snippets of vowel sounds, musical notes, and so forth, that were theoretically playable, but didn't really appear to be worth playing. Uh, I have since adduced some. Uh, here, for example, are the three oldest sound recordings currently known to have been made in the United States, uh, probably in early 1874. <clears throat> My first sounds colleagues and I refer among ourselves to recordings like these as thwips and farts. Uh, for many years, though, this was all anybody had reason to hope for from the pre-Edisonian world of recorded sound. That changed in early 2008 when our research pointed us towards so much longer phonautograms preserved in French libraries and archives, documenting relatively extended pieces of speech and song. Uh, here you see David Giovannoni inspecting some of them when he traveled to Paris to prepare high-resolution scans. At present, we've located a total of 50 surviving Scott phonautograms. The most promising specimen we turned up at the start of 2008 was a phonautogram of Eau Claire de la Lune, as sung on April 9, 1860, according to its inscription. We immediately set to work to play it back. Uh, David did the image processing, and our partners at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory carried out the raw conversion to audio. Here's what it sounded like straight off the paper. Doesn't sound like much played that way, does it? The problem is that Scott rotated the cylinder of his phonograph by hand, and its speed was irregular enough to distort a sung melody beyond recognition. Uh, fortunately, Scott had recorded the vibrations of a tuning fork as a time reference alongside the trace of the voice, and he documented the frequency of the tuning fork, 500 simple vibrations per second. So, when David emailed me the uncorrected results, I took a stereo file with the voice in one channel and the tuning fork in the other channel, that's what you just heard, and stayed up into the wee hours of the morning adjusting the tuning fork to 500 hertz, five cycles at a time. Somewhere around sunrise, I finally got to hear someone recognizably singing Eau Claire de la Lune in Paris in the year 1860, before the outbreak of the American Civil War. Mind blowing, here, here it is. We drew two conclusions from this. First, the singer sounded like a young girl and we speculated that she might be the inventor's daughter. Who, who knows, but that seemed like a good hypothesis. Second, Scott had recorded sounds successfully enough in 1860 
for us to be able to recognize a sung tune from its playback. Nobody had known that until then. When the news of what our group had accomplished broke in March 2008, it was interesting to see how the media in different places chose to report it. The New York Times headline was, Researchers play tune recorded before Edison. In France, it was, 20 years before Edison, a Frenchman invented sound recording. <laughs> in Germany, it was, sounds like a strangled chicken. <laughs> Radio reportage had quirks of its own. Here's what the, uh, the BBC had to say. American historians have discovered what they think is the earliest recording of the human voice, made on a device which scratched sound waves onto paper blackened by smoke. It was made in 1860, 17 years before Thomas Edison first demonstrated the gramophone, and featured an excerpt from a French song, Au Claire de la Lune. The, the award-winning screenwriter Abby Mann has died at the age of 80. He won an Academy Award in 1961 for Judgment at Nuremberg. Abby, excuse me, sorry. Abby Mann also won several Emmys, including, including one in 1973 for a, for a film which featured a police, a police detective called the character on whom a long-running TV series was eventually based. It's ten minutes past eight. Fighting between sheer militia... YouTube reveals that the BBC reporter wasn't alone in catching the giggles from our work. <laughs> Others responded a little differently. Now listen to the audio. This is so spooky. It's the song Au Clair de la Lune. They just got the second verse of it, but you gotta listen to this. It is so spooky. In, in short, our playback of Scott's phonogram seems to have affected some people, at least, on a visceral, emotional level, whether provoking them to laughter or giving them goosebumps. Uh, and those may be appropriate reactions to the experience of hearing back further in time than anyone had ever had the opportunity to do before. But at that point, phonautograms had still only just begun to yield up the secrets and experiences they were destined to divulge. As I've already mentioned, there are a few different ways to convert a wavy line, like the one at the top of the screen, into digital samples in a playable sound file. For our initial breakthrough in 2008, we relied on software developed by our colleagues at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory as part of an optical playback system for analog gramophone records. Uh, that software uses algorithms to try to identify the position of the trace at each successive point along the time axis, as though it were being followed by a stylus on a turntable. A uh, virtual stylus, they call it. My own approach, which I didn't come up with until a few months later, instead processes the waveform as you see at the bottom, in effect measuring the relative amounts of green and yellow at each successive point along the time axis. I call this the optical film soundtrack method because it involves converting the waveform into a band of varying width, a common format for optical film soundtracks like the one shown here on the right. The second approach is more labor intensive than the virtual stylus. Uh, but because I end up doing a lot of preparation by hand in graphics editing software, I can sometimes resolve the wave shape more accurately than the algorithm of the virtual stylus. Uh, here you see a piece of the phonautogram of Eau Claire de la Lune. Our original results with the virtual stylus are shown at the bottom, and the results I got using my own method a few years later are shown at the top. As I think you can probably see, my version successfully follows the trace at points where the virtual stylus algorithm got confused by distracting visual noise. But when I devised this second technique, I wasn't really trying to produce more accurate results, so much as I was trying to find a way to adduce phonautograms that had at first looked completely unplayable, such as these, traces with broad smudges and points where the trace loops backwards relative to the direction of recording. <laughs> 
These violate the basic assumptions of the virtual stylus approach. Imagine trying to play grooves shaped like this on a turntable with a stylus, and you'll understand why. By contrast, my optical film soundtrack method can accommodate highly distorted traces without violating its basic logic. After all, I don't need to match each point in time to a single position. I just need to fill the area above or below the trace. This approach doesn't correct the distortions, but it doesn't get thrown off by them either. Loopbacks and other problems essentially get averaged out, smoothed over, allowing us to extract something audible out of traces that would otherwise be beyond hope. In the batch of phonograms we discovered in early 2008, there was one particularly distorted looking phonogram, a recitation from an Italian play, Aminta by Torquato Tasso. Scott wrote out the text itself at the bottom of the sheet. In translation, it runs, who would believe that under human form and under this pastoral garb would be found a god, not only, and then it cuts off. He also added an important footnote. I was wrong, he writes. It should be umane forme. The order of two of the words is messed up. The official text of the play has umane forme, but Scott had initially written forme umane. Scott takes responsibility for the mistake. Now the question was, had he simply written it down wrong or was he taking responsibility for having recited it incorrectly, in which case we'd know that this was a recording of Scott's own voice. To find out whether the phonogram itself featured the phrase umane forme or forme umane, we had to play it back and hope we could tell from listening. And since it happened to be one of the badly distorted examples, it was one of the first phonograms I tried to play back using my optical film soundtrack method. After using the tuning fork trace to correct for speed fluctuations, here's what I heard when I adduced this phonogram at the same speed as Eau Claire de la Lune. <laughs> That sounded unmistakably like a recording of speech being played at twice the correct speed. Uh, here it is again at half that speed. Well, the speaker does say forme umane. So we confirmed that it was Scott himself speaking to us across the ages. But we also learned that we've been playing back other phonograms, including Eau Claire de la Lune, at twice the correct speed. It turns out that 500 simple vibrations per second actually corresponds to 250 hertz, not 500 hertz. We thought we had recovered the voice of Scott's daughter. It turned out to be a 19th century equivalent of the chipmunks. Here's the April 9th, 1860 phonogram of Eau Claire de la Lune adduced at what we now recognize as the correct speed. Clearly not a young girl anymore. And the singing seems painfully slow. I'm sure you can understand how we thought at first that the faster, higher pitched version was the correct one. But Scott's notes on the phonogram show he was aiming to make a record for visual analysis of pitch. And singing the piece in this lugubrious fashion would have given him nice, long, regular waveforms to study. Eau Claire de la Lune was more decipherability experiment than performance. And yet, by listening to other phonograms, we discovered that Scott occasionally did record lively performances of singing as well. Here's the Song of the Bee from Queen Topaz, a comic opera by Victor Massé. <laughs> Scott's spoken word phonograms are similarly varied in approach. Here's an example in which he's written in the syllables above the traces corresponding to them, suggesting that he's trying to determine whether he can decipher speech sounds visually. <laughs> <laughs> 
When we listen, Scott's delivery uh, seems to be calibrated to that goal. But at other times, Scott seems to have been less interested in deciphering words than in capturing the intonations of dramatic elocution. His favorite passage for demonstration purposes along these lines was an excerpt from a French adaptation of Othello that ran like this. So, to this faithless rival Edelmon must have given this diadem. In their cruel rage, our lions of the desert, beneath their burning lair, sometimes tear apart the trembling traveler. It would be better for him, for their devouring hunger, to scatter the scraps of his palpitating flesh than to fall alive into my terrible hands. <laughs> this seems to have been Scott's equivalent of, oh, thank you, of Thomas Edison's Mary Had a Little Lamb. Uh, what you see on the screen is a hybrid inscription in which Scott uh, tried to show how he thought the paralinguistic features recorded by his phonautograph could be used to augment the written word, bringing it to life in contrast with what he regarded as the dead speech of ordinary text. But here's an actual phonautogram of the same passage made on April 17th, 1860. Uh, whether or not you can make out the words, you can tell from listening that this record features exaggerated intonational patterns. In other words, Scott's hamming it up. Of course, by making these documents audible, we are subverting Scott's own intentions, as and the title of an essay by Jonathan Stern and Mitchell Akiyama refers to the Eau Claire de la Lune phonogram appropriately enough as the recording that never wanted to be heard. Uh, phonograms were originally meant for visual analysis, and it is useful to study them visually, which is why the First Sounds Initiative has also published facsimiles of all of them online. However, it would be pretty hard to distinguish expressive performances from tests of sheer decipherability just by looking at the waveforms. So we learn important things about the scope of Scott's pioneering efforts to record sound by listening to them, quite apart from the affective experience we gain from doing this. And there's nothing wrong with, quote, using documents contrary to the way they were designed and intended to draw out materials, insights, and understandings that the recorders never intended to preserve, wording that its author, Carol Miskowski, meant to describe the subversive analytical practice of reading against the grain, but that strikes me as equally applicable to educing against the grain. The phonogram you just heard is the oldest known recording of spoken language we can listen to at a reliably constant speed, uh, just as the April 9th, 1860 Eau Claire de la Lune phonogram is the oldest known recording of the human voice we can listen to at a reliable constant speed. Uh, even earlier examples of Scott phonograms do exist, uh, but unfortunately they don't have the tuning fork trace as a time reference. There's no reliable way to correct for the irregular rotational speed of the cylinder, so for the moment at least, we end up with audio from them that sounds like this. Taken as a whole, Scott's phonograms are the world's oldest sound recordings in the sense of records made over time of sound vibrations passing through the air. But we can educe even older inscriptions as audio. For example, these waveforms from a plate printed in 1806 are supposed to illustrate the concept of beats. They were drawn rather than automatically recorded, so there's no past reality to play back but we can still adduce 
the waveforms just as we adduced the phonautograms. They can be similarly brought out, elicited, developed as audio from a condition of latent, rudimentary, or merely potential existence. So what you just heard was derived directly from this print, and it's also consistent with the inscription's intended meaning as a representation of sound. That's why I feel justified in thinking of this as legitimate audio content from the year 1806. Now, I don't know of any earlier drawings of acoustic waveforms than this one, but the waveform's only one way of displaying acoustic data as a graph of time versus amplitude. Another option is the sound spectrogram, a graph of time versus frequency. These two forms of display are largely interchangeable to the point that many pieces of audio editing software will let you toggle back and forth between them. And sound spectrograms can be adduced as audio too. I've been using a program called Audio Paint for this purpose, although there are a number of options. Here's a spectrogram published in 1947, supposedly of the phrase, she was waiting on my lawn. Let's listen. She was waiting at my lawn. <clears throat> A little uncanny sounding maybe, but, but clear enough that we can tell the caption is wrong. The speaker actually says she was waiting at my lawn. She was waiting at my lawn. So are you all with me that this is a playable sound recording format? Like well, I call this spectrographic approach to the adduction of historical audio paleospectrophony, old spectrum sounding. And as with the phenakistoscopic animations we saw earlier, paleospectrophony can take us further back into the past than you might think. Here's a plate Athanasius Kircher included in his 1650 book, Musurgia Universalis, showing how to pin a barrel organ. I adduced that using the same technique that gave us she was waiting at my lawn a few moments ago. Uh, it just so happens that this 365-year-old engraving conforms to the format expectations of a modern sound spectrogram as a graph of time versus frequency. And the music we hear when we treat it that way is approximately the music Kircher originally meant to encode, even if our method is radically different from anything Kircher himself could have imagined. Even some forms of medieval musical notation can be adduced paleospectrophonically to give us a semblance of their originally intended content. Here's a specimen of Desayan musical notation from a manuscript of the mid 10th century. The fact that we can do something like this illustrates a long-term continuity in our most basic cultural conventions for depicting sound, the spatial positioning of notes along an axis running from left to right as a metaphor for the passage of time, and up and down as metaphors for higher and lower frequency. I could argue that such continuities exist, but by demonstrating them in practice this way, I think I can make a somewhat more compelling case. I wouldn't say that this is a more authentic Record rendering of the music than, say, a historically informed modern performance of it, far from it. However, I believe mine is the least intrusive method available for converting these inscriptions into sound. I don't do anything subjectively to them beyond specifying time and frequency scales, a step roughly equivalent to deciding on a playback speed for a gramophone disc. In some cases, though, we do have more important methodological choices to make, as in the case of my alligator stereo view. Uh, consider the, the indented paper strip documenting Samuel Morse's famous transmission of the words, what hath God wrought to Baltimore from the Capitol building in Washington on May 24th, 1844. The first message that had ever been sent in a completed working telegraph line in the United States. This was a watershed moment in the history of modern telecommunications, but I believe it's also significant for another reason. 
to the best of my knowledge, it was the first event of such historical magnitude to be recorded automatically in a form we can reproduce today, actualizing the dots and dashes over time. The speed should have been about 30 letters per minute, judging from contemporaneous sources. But what should we use to represent those dots and dashes, originally electrical impulses triggered by a telegraph key? We could use a flashing light, tend to be better equipped to follow rhythms by ear than by eye, so I think inducing this as sound is likely to be more effective. For track 27 in my book CD project, Pictures of Sound, 1,000 Years of Adduced Audio, I arbitrarily chose to adduce the marks using a random noise sample. <laughs> like that. Uh, but it since occurred to me that people tend to associate Morse code with the sound of an oscillator. Beep, 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 beep. So I'd like to conclude my presentation this morning by sharing Morse's famous Washington to Baltimore transmission of what hath God wrought as it would have sounded if it had been picked up by a 1,000 hertz oscillator. Uh, you can decide for yourself if this is uh, grossly anachronistic or helps bring a historical moment to life. If you'd like to see and hear more work in this spirit, I invite you to check out my website at griffinage.com. Thank you for your kind attention. Um, first, I want to say thank you for having me here today. I'm very excited to present some of this work. Um, before I begin, as I said, or as uh, Jim kindly introduced me, I have a, my PhD is actually in English literature from the University of Maryland. I worked at MITH, the Maryland Institute for Technology and the Humanities, for many years. I started my work in digital humanities at UVA where I got my MFA in fiction um, under you know, people there at the time were John Unsworth and Steve Ramsey and Bethany Novisky. Um, Johanna Drucker was still there at the time. So I've been doing digital humanities uh, for quite a long time, primarily focused in working with text and large collections of text. The Project Monk um, that was mentioned earlier was one of the early efforts to, to figure out what humanists could do with these large collections of texts that had been digitized um, uh, that was useful for scholarship. And so <clears throat> during that time, I created some relationships or developed some relationships with the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign um, Informatics Institute and some colleagues there. Um, and this work stems from that because what we started to, th to think through was, well, digital humanities was doing a lot with text collections, but there are other collections out there, um, like audio that we've seen earlier, that um, haven't been educted in the similar manners, and we wanted to sort of start thinking that through. So the, <clears throat> the title of my talk is Towards the Rationale of Audio Text. Um, in part because I do think of it from the perspective of text. Um, the, the rationale of audio text is something that I'm thinking about in, in my research and my scholarship, but I'm not gonna talk about it too much today other than to uh, focus on it at the beginning as a perspective um, that comes, you know, I think I saw reflected in um, Patrick's uh, presentation as well in terms of thinking through what it means to do work with sound. What is sound? How do we perceive sound? Um, and how do we perceive sound in relationship to text, which is how we typically tend to perceive our, our artifacts. Um, Charles Bernstein has written that the sound file would become, if it were you know, actually taught in classrooms and accessed in classrooms and disseminated in classrooms instead of the sort of Norton anthology of poetry that you might see, the sound file would become a text for study, much like the visual document. The acoustic experience of listening to the poem would begin to compete with the visual experience of reading the poem. Fascinated by this idea because 
what if it changed the nature of our understanding of most of our poetry canon, um, that that's been recorded, if in part and parcel with studying the text document, we were also listening to performances and thinking about what the performance lended that the text, the actual physical text uh, did not. Uh, and thinking about that in terms of Jerome McGann's work uh, with textual study, if we think about what, what is actually the definition that he gives us for a rationale, we mean the dynamic structure of a document as it is realized in determinant, artisanal, and determinable reflective ways. And what I think is interesting about McGann, and, and then I'm going to sort of leave this idea of um, the rationale of audio text to your sort of broader imagination, is this idea that it is, it is as um, Patrick was showing us, not only you know, the content, but how that content is disseminated and how we perceive it by nature of how it's disseminated. So um, the driving research question uh, behind some of the work that we're doing is, you know, what does it mean to study poetry through sound recordings? How is the rationale of an audio file realized in a digital environment? And what impact does that realization have on how we understand our sound heritage? And this is my little iconic image. Um, so first, I divided this into three parts. Uh, first, I want to introduce the project High Performance Sound Technologies for Access and Scholarship. It did actually say analysis first instead of access, but then I, I changed that um, because I think that access is a, is a primary aspect of a lot of this work. Um, we have to create access to digital text before we can do all of these things we do in digital humanities. It's the same with audio. And that issue of access to audio is... I think central and key to thinking through a lot of these questions. Um, what are we accessing, how, um, and how does that impact what we do with it? I'm going to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> some of the work we're doing with Penn Sound and then uh, a second case study. Um, I've got lots of numbers on this screen. Uh, the Alan Lomax collection, some work that we're doing with that in terms of uh, folklore collections. So the project that I'm working within is called, um, like I said, High Performance Sound Technologies for Access and Scholarship, or HIPSTAs, one of those acronyms that you think are funny when you're in your office and you're applying for funding, and then it just sort of, you have to go out in public and say it out loud, and there's nothing really very hip about the project, but maybe that is actually the definition of hipster. You just, you can't admit that you're so cool. Um, the It's been generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the first Funding was a, um, well, I should, first I should uh, tell you about my team. So there's myself. Um, I'm also working with Loretta Avil, David Chang, and Tony Boris out of the Illinois Informatics Institute, and David Enstrom. Um, the software that we're primarily using, that I'll introduce in a moment, was created by David Chang, who was working with David Enstrom, um, and they were working together to create software for David Enstrom because he, as an ornithologist, had hundreds of hours of collections of bird calls and he wanted to be able to sort through and search and browse through those bird calls um, by, uh, you know, you put a mic out in the field for many hours, it collects all kinds of sounds and he wanted to find the birds in those sounds so he could focus on them. Uh, and in the previous work that I was doing when we were looking at large text documents, or large collections of text documents. Um, David, who is a uh, musician and um, a research scientist who works with this sort of sound analysis software, uh, in conversation with him, we came up with the idea, well, why couldn't we do this with sound collections of interest in the humanities? So um, our primary goals in this project were to develop a virtual research environment in which users can better access and analyze spoken word collections of interest through um, Assessing what scholars already do when they're analyzing sound, many, some scholars do actually use sound recordings in their classroom or in their research, and I was interested in sort of thinking through, okay, well, what are they actually, what kinds of questions are they asking when they use these sound collections? Thinking through what it meant to create a system that was actually usable to um, people who were not computer scientists, um, a lot of what you see in <clears throat> There's a lot of work being done in, in music information retrieval for um, searching and analyzing large collections of musical audio, 
And a lot of that work is not accessible to your average everyday person. Um, there's a lot of work that happens, as Patrick was showing when he was just saying, you know, I was up until the wee hours of the morning, or I was looking through these details. There's a lot of invisible work we call in information studies, uh, invisible work that happens in the infrastructure of getting data from, you know, a collection that you might have here to something that you annotate, that you have an iterative sort of back and forth relationship with um, with the machine. And so what we're interested too is assessing what it actually meant to create technology that humanist scholars could use. And then finally doing some tests that demonstrate the efficacy of using the tools. So the first uh, funding that we had from the NEH was actually from the Office of Digital Humanities and it was for an Institute for Advanced Study in Technologies in the Humanities. And what we did is we, we made a call for participation. Um, we had 20 participants in the first um, two years in the study, and, uh, or in the project rather. Nine librarians and archivists, eight humanities scholars, um, three advanced graduate students in humanities and information science. And what we wanted to do was gather people who were used to working with sound from these different perspectives and have them actually use David Chang's software and see what they could do with the collections that were of interest to them. Oops. So the collections we had at the beginning, because there's a lot of sort of pre-processing that has to do, has to happen before you can, um, you know, uh, do more advanced processing, was poetry from Penn Sound. So Penn Sound was, has been part of this from the very beginning and, and their support really helped, I think, attract funding from NEH. Folklore at the Dolph Briscoe Center for American History at UT Austin, where I am. Speeches at the Lyndon B. Johnson Library and Presidential Museum. And then storytelling traditions at the Native American Projects at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia. Uh, and we had participants at the beginning. Um, we, it was a two-year project. We met twice, once in the May of 2013 and once in May of 2014, bringing the participants to Austin both those times. And in the intervening year, um, working with participants virtually to help them sort of figure out the software and to see how it was corresponding with the, the kinds of research that they were doing. Other collections of interest to the participants there, we uh, had the archivist from StoryCorps. We had participants from the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress. Um, we had other participants coming from um, at Emory University, the speeches in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. So, you know, Martin Luther King's recordings. And then interviews from um, interviews and recordings from other smaller library collections. And I put this slide up here just to indicate that the, these kinds of collections proliferate, right? They're, they're, they're everywhere. Um, there's a lot of cultural heritage out there that's in sound that we are, it's currently inaccessible for um, a lot of work beyond simple playback. And even simple playback is, is, can be difficult to do in a classroom with students annotating, et cetera. Um, the software that we use that David created, he uh, created software. I'm not going to go through the sort of technologies of, of adduction that we heard earlier, but he creates uh, spectrograms like the one you see here through um, signal processing analysis of the audio digital. He does something called bandpass filters instead of FFTs, which some people in the room might find controversial and we can talk about later. But essentially what he does is um, he reproduces the sound into a digital format and um, uses the data behind the spectrogram to uh, create a mathematical symbolic relationship that he then uses for machine learning. And I'll get back to that in a second. The um, collections that I'm going to talk about mostly today are, is the poetry from Penn Sound and folklore. Um, and these are the only collections that we were able to ingest into the software that we ended up using. And in part, that's an access uh, issue. Penn Sound is very clear that their role is to create as much access as possible to these recordings. They're very open about sharing their recordings. Um, the same was at, you know, I'm a... Um, professor at UT, so they were very happy to have give me access to their collections. But some other collections, there are copyright issues, there are all kinds of access issues, so that's clearly always a concern. Um, I'm going to start with our, our, our Penn Sound example. There are, as of March 1st, 35,000 files in Penn Sound, 5,677.54 hours. 
Um, some of that is duplicated. So we had to do some deduplication. So um, interpreting the metadata and file names using a decision tree, which meant that we ended up with 30,000 30, hours and, um, or sorry, 30,000 files and about 5,000 hours of audio from PenSound. We took um, three second examples from PenSound, and I think that's my next slide. So um, we took three second examples from PenSound and randomly chosen across about 2,000 files. So even from PenSound, we took a subset. Doing this kind of, of work on a large collection of audio uh, creates a lot of data. If you think about doing um, analysis on a text document, and if you think about a level of analysis that might be on every word, and if you think about a um, analysis that takes every word and gives you the phonetic spelling of it, gives you the part of speech, gives you, um, you know, possibly it stems the word into its, its different roots. That's a lot of collective data on each word. Well, the, the same kind of data is magnified if you start to sort of pull sound out and try to identify different aspects of it. One of the things that we were able to do in this project is to hook our software up to the supercomputer at the University of Texas, um, which made a lot of the processing a lot easier. Uh, that sort of begs the question of whether or not uh, projects like these are possible for people that don't have supercomputers, uh, and that's something that we're thinking about in the context of this project as well. Um, and I think some people in the room, so Chris Mustaz is here, is, has been, had various success with using the software to do certain things primarily because some questions provide or sort of ask for a lot more computational memory than other kinds of questions. So um, what we did is we uh, locally, myself and Steve McLaughlin, who is, uh, had worked at PennSound for many years and is now getting his PhD, with us at the University of Texas in information science. Um, Steve went through and found three second examples of applause all across these 2,000 subset of files in Penn Sound. Um, he found 274 applause examples and then 582 non-applause examples. Uh, and the reason for this is because when you're doing machine learning as we were trying to do, um, what happens in machine learning is essentially, uh, like David Enstrom, the ornithologist, you give the machine examples, and then you tell the machine to go find more examples like the one that you gave them. So if I'm David Enstrom and I'm, I'm looking for a bird call, I say, okay, here's the red-billed warbler. Here's, here's, here's an example of it singing. Here's another example of it singing. Here's a third example of it singing. Here's 500 examples of it singing go through these 300,000 hours of audio that I have and, and find me more like these. So in order for us to find something like applause in Penn Sound, which was one of our areas of interest, you have to give the machine many examples. But not only examples of what applause is, but also examples of what applause is not. So it has something to, against which to determine. Um, from those examples, and I'll show you this in a second, we took, um, we divided into a 1 32nd second time slice, um, ending up with 4,000 applause, non-applause examples, and ended up predicting 1,948 files that the machine hadn't seen, and I'll show you that in a second. What this work entails is, um, so Steve does, Steve or I or anybody does something like this, goes through the audio files and picks those sections that have something in it of interest um, in order to show it to the machine. Then Arlo actually goes through and um, sections those cutouts into one second time slots and even further sections those one second time slots. This is um, time across the x-axis and um, you know the, the hertz is on the y-axis. Um, and takes these one second, this is, this is an audio recording, and takes those one second time slots and slices it up even further into 30 second parts. And in part because um, you want the machine to have as many examples as possible and sound is so much variance even in a second of time that if you slice it up even further you, give, you can give the machine more examples. Then what ends up happening is um, after the prediction, you end up with a CSV file like this. And I put this up there because what does this tell us? This tells us very little. Uh, and so along that pipeline of doing analysis with sound, you know, first you start with, okay, what are the kinds of questions that we have? 
how do we indicate that to the machine in such a way that we can articulate what we're interested in? Is applause actually interesting? We'll get to that in a second, but applause was, it was a sonic feature that we could think of that would be discernible against other sonic features. So then you do the analysis, and what you get back are these kinds of files. This is important to think through as well, primarily because, um, as Patrick was indicating, how you analyze these, all of these steps along the way are going to indicate the kinds of results that you end up getting. Um, one of the reasons, and I'm going to show you the results in a minute, um, some of the reasons why we were interested in Penn Sound was um, to think about what aspects of the poetry reading we could make visible. Um, one aspect that sound makes visible in the recording is um, applause at the end. So what you can see here, so these are things you know you would expect. You have a, you have a, you have a recording and people clap when it's over. Um, <clears throat> so what you see here is the time on the bottom and then the um, y-axis is the machine's guess at where there is or isn't applause. Um, so here at the end, the machine's telling us that it's very probable that there is applause here at the end. And in Penn Sound in the sample that we did, you see quite a few of these. Um, you see, this is Eileen. It's too bad that the, we saw this earlier, the screen still seems to be shoved up a little bit. But this is Eileen Miles' um, Readings in Contemporary Poetry at Chelsea in 2010. Um, then you see things like this, where somebody gets quite a bit of applause at the end of a performance. That is um, Blazer Robin, uh, Vancouver in 2003. This is Lisa Robertson at Pegasus Books in 2007. Oh, thank you, perfect. Uh, yes, that's good. Um, again, applause at the end. Um, and we can do this across the entire collection, say, okay, well, where are, where are people getting applause? Where are they not getting applause? Um, you can see things, other kinds of formations, applause at the beginning and at the end, something else you're probably typically expecting to see, and we see a bunch of those. Um, the other thing that you might see is applause as a delimiter between introduction and start of reading. Now, one of the reasons you might care about this kind of thing um, is depending on how good your metadata is in your collection depends on what you can find in your collection. And unless a person has sat down and, you know, sort of written down exactly what's happening in a recording, which is a um, human resource that most collections don't have, you, you won't know that these things are in there. Um, so we also saw applause as a delimiter between an intro introduction and a start of reading, so it might be a way to delimit when an introduction ends and the rest of a, po of a reading begins. We saw quite a few of those. Uh, for group readings, applause as a delimiter between readers as, as a way to segment files. So you see a lot of readings where we know there are multiple people and we can see where they begin and where they end. Now the other thing that's interesting about this kind of approach is that if you're doing this sort of analysis in something like Audacity or other um, software that allows you to see uh, what's happening in an audio file when things get louder or softer, is this is actually a way of notating it, of annotating what those things actually are. Because even if you see something get, something get loud and go soft, you're not exactly sure what it is. Um, so in some ways, this is a nice method for annotating collections without having to go through all of them. And we see a bunch of those in the collection. Um, you might also see some uh, erratic kinds of applause in the middle of a single person's reading. So it may be that they are reading a collection of poetry and you didn't know that, um, or perhaps they're reading a longer poem, or you can see where they're reading the shorter poems or where they are reading the longer poems. This is Sid Corman, a cel celebratory reading. Um, and the same with... Uh, I think we're, we're, we're losing the image again up at the top, um, and I can't read mine, but uh, this is an, another example of that, and we see quite a few of those in singular authors who are um, creating readings. This annotating of applause allows you to see a structure 
of the recording in a way that you couldn't have seen it before. Um, other newly observed structures. So one thing that we saw that, that gave us pause was this notion that there was a climactic applause and singular poetry readings about two thirds of the way through or, or half, somewhere between half and two thirds. And one of the things that Steve and I were speculating is whether this was sort of a, um, a climax in a poem, right? You sort of get to this point and then, and then the rest of it of course is denouement. But uh, you know, there was uh, several, several readings where you can see this kind of significant increase in applause about two thirds of the way through a reading and we were interested in sort of thinking through that structure a little bit more. So there's quite a few of those as well. So wait, are there mistakes? Yes, there are mistakes. Um, there's a lot of false IDs. If there's a strong hiss, we found that uh, the machine thought that was applause as well. Um, dissonant music, uh, that was clearly indicated to the machine that that was applause, but no, it's just smut monkey, um, you know, making dissonant music. Um, or uh, here's another dissonant music part, um, or the bagpipe. It also thought the bagpipe was applause. And we see that in the folklore collection too. There's a lot of, um, what we were interested in the folklore collection was trying to discern when in the, in the field recordings a person was singing a cappella, when um, there was instruments involved, when the person was singing with an instrument, um, and when people were speaking. And there was a lot of mistakes with the violin. The, the machine thought the violin was a person speaking quite often. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> you know, there's also these kinds of outliers. There's long applause instances and many breaks. There's, um, you know, many applause instances can indicate an exceptionally eager audience or an exceptionally good reading. Um, so we see that in these singular readings. So um, the other kinds of questions we were thinking, well, you know, beyond these sort of simple structural, or structural questions, you know, what other kinds of questions can we ask? And we pose it in this way because I see this work and I see a, a lot of the work to me, that's the most interesting in digital humanities. It starts with discovery. These are sort of discovery and hypothesis generating kinds of um, interactions with our cultural heritage objects, as opposed to analysis that says, you know, this is what's there, end of question, we've solved Shakespeare, now we can walk away and not ask any more questions. Um, I see these as real sort of uh, provocative experiences that, you know, as Patrick was indicating, um, allow us to ask different kinds of questions than we've ever been able to ask before. So we started to brainstorm, well, you know, do poets get more applause as they get older or just the really famous ones? Um, is there something about um, the perceived demographics of a poet? You know, do women or men get more applause? Do people of a certain color get more applause? Is there, are there venues where people get more applause or regions where people get more applause? And what, it, what does this tell us about the audience there or about the poet? Um, these are just sort of kinds of questions to uh, think about, but then to think about more closely, perhaps in more traditional ways. Um, you know, was there more applause in the 80s and the 90s or now? We can't ask those questions yet. Um, in part, and this comes back to the issue of access, and I know you can't read that, I'm gonna pull it up in a second, but I wanted to give you the sort of visual framework of where this is happening. Pen Sound is amazing, and they've done a lot of really good work getting um, audio of poetry performances up and up quickly, um, and with, with some metadata. The metadata, though, uh, for us has been kind of a struggle. Uh, in order for us to figure out, you know, whether what kind of applause is going on specific to a certain venue, we need to be able to pull venue information out, right, um, in such a way that we can then map it against these other data points. The um, <clears throat> metadata in Penn Sound, some of which is very important to us, is all lumped up in one field. Um, and so we need to do the work of you know, pulling out the series. What reading series was it? What venue was it in? Um, what other speakers might be on the tape that aren't actually present? And this kind of information has to end up, you know, if you think, if you think of the world in terms of a, um, a spreadsheet, we need a column with this information in it in order for us to be able to kind of think about it in relationship to the information that we're able to pull out from the machine. So this issue of access doesn't go away and it has an effect um, all the way through our interactions with these, with these readings. 
And a lot of the work that we've been doing, our first funding um, came in 2012, I believe, and we're just now kind of pulling out these results. Um, the work that you just saw on Penn Sound was, was not easy to get, uh, and part of what we're seeing our work as in this is really trying to create that pipeline between, you know, someone has an audio collection, um, how, do you, how do you get them to the place where they can even ask questions of that audio collection? And a lot of this happens behind the scene, but it's something that people need to be cognizant of that it's important, you know, when you're doing metadata, you wanna make sure you, you have metadata. So this is, this is unreadable by, uh, by choice. Um, we've published a lot on this work. In part, I think, because uh, it, it's, it's an interesting space, um, especially in digital humanities, where the focus has been primarily on text-based artifacts. Um, the poets, in particular, have been really uh, prolific about sort of, you know, publishing their, their initial interactions with Penn Sound through Arlo and, um, you know, sort of ideas about where they're going to go where they're gonna go next. So including Chris Mustaza, who's in the room, so I'm gonna embarrass him for a second. Um, you know, this work that's been published in a special um, section of Jacket 2, and I, I encourage all of you all to go listen to it, is, um, or to go read it, uh, is interesting in part because it's in the context of Penn Sounds. So you can actually go to the recordings that are being spoken about, um, but it's also very, forward-looking, and so I want to read a little bit about, I want to read a little bit of what these poem, these poets uh, and scholars have written about their work with, with Penn Sound, because I think it gives you a flavor of, of where this kind of discovery work can go. So um, Chris has written, and he's also been funded, and thanks to this forum, is that what if there is a pattern in this noise that is imperceptible to the human ear but recognizable to so-called machine learning? He's interested in the Contemporary Poets series, a series of recordings of poets made at Columbia University in the 1930s and 1940s. This is a quote from his work. The collection, one of the first archives of poetry audio, was, was recorded on aluminum records. In the process of editing the recordings, most of which were heretofore unreleased, I noticed that various sections of the recordings had been later distributed by record labels like Cadmon and had found their way into Penn Sound. The Lindsay Vachel collection is a good example of this. So he writes, while my archi archival work was led to a confirmation of the provenance of these recordings, it also raises the questions about what other recordings from this series exist in Penn Sound. He's been building on Ty Jones' work to construct a bibliography of this series, but there's a lot of work that remains to be done. For example, he writes, I had previously posited that the Gertrude Stein recordings in Penn Sound are from the Columbia, the Contemporary Poets series, based on archival scholarship, but what if there was a way to confirm this and to locate other recordings from the CPS and Penn Sound by using machine listening to conduct pattern recognition on the ubiquitous, ubiquitous hiss in these recordings? So in other words, um, you know, sound artifacts, as, as we've seen, have other kinds of information in them beyond the, the transcript, which is what we typically get from sound artifacts, right? So what we're typically given when we go to a collection is here's the transcript of the content go along your way, analyze this. But what we're trying to posit with this, um, with this particular intervention is, you know, speech, speech recognition is great, um, creating automatic transcripts is great, but what other materials, sonic materials, are in these collections that are of interest? Um, and so Chris is, is very interested in trying to think through the material, materiality of the actual recording artifact in order to figure out and, and what other artifacts might have a relationship in, in the context of the recording. Um, he sees value of this in phonotextual history, uh, but also, and one of the things that I think is most fascinating about Chris's work is this notion that you know, we need to think through how we are digitizing our audio such that maybe we don't want to get rid of hiss. Um, or maybe we have an archival version of it that includes hiss and then a cleaned up version that, you know, plays well on the internet. Something like that. Um, another example is Eric Retberg's Hearing the Audience, also appearing in Jacket 2 this spring. 
Uh, Eric writes, by using Arlo's distant listening, I search for moments of laughter that point to productive sites for close listening, including moments when self-fashioned, serious poets tell jokes, moments when audiences find humor in poetry intended to be serious, and moments when audiences experience collective delight in humor and poetry that might not be revealed in private reading from the page. When audience members laugh, Eric writes, in the midst of a poetry recording, they remind the listener that she is not listening to a monologic performance, but to a dialogic exchange. The results of my initial experiment with a single performance of these spectrograms are promising. Arlo managed to find a large number of instances of laughter, not just in the files I tagged, but also in the files I hadn't. Once I have a large varied supply a sample of human tags, I'll put Arlo to work to find laughter in the entire pen sound. After the machine has helped me find laughter, I'll set it aside to pursue the more traditionally humanistic research activities of listening, contextualizing, and interpreting. There's also the work by Ken Sherwood. Uh, Ken is interested in looking at versions of poems. So he writes, I decided to build upon a long-standing interest in the discrepancies and variations in the ways poets perform their own poems on different occasions and varied places. In particular, I wanted to compare variant recordings in terms of tempo, loudness, pitch range, tension, rhythm, and voice quality, things that um, Ken has written in other places he finds are, are emergent, right? They're the sort of emergent meanings that come out of a poetry performance that can't actually be reconciled on the page. If we intuitively recognize, he writes, that some readings are more dynamic than others, that some versions come across as readings while others constitute emergent performances, then there are a number of broad questions worth exploring in the future. What kinds of variations are introduced when a poet reads a given poem several times over a year? Are there patterns in the way a given poem reads when in front of a library audience in contrast to with a performance in a coffee house or bar or lecture hall? Or lecture hall? Does a featured reader perform differently than when participating in a group reading? Etc. To the extent that we find it interesting to pursue such questions, he writes, we will be using computational analysis and visual tools like Arlo to help us frame the answers. Although I don't know whether I necessarily believe in answers. So um, the last example I'm going to give you is um, by Merritt MacArthur. Uh, she's got a piece coming out in PMLA um, called Monotony, the Churches of Poetry Reading and Sound Studies. So um, this is from her abstract. Uh, she writes, engaging with and amending the terms of debates about pro poetry performance, MacArthur locates the origins of the default neutral style of contemporary academic poetry readings within trends in secular performance and religious ritual, exploring the partial influences of the beats, black arts, and the African American church. So she's using these kinds of analyses to contextualize the sound recordings in a, in a sort of more traditional way. Um, and part of the argument that she makes about looking at um, pitch traces, et cetera, is the extent to which you can then sort of, you, you can then frame your argument in the context of these larger cultural movements. She, the abstract goes on. She employs line graphs of intonation patterns to demonstrate one version of the neutral style termed monotonous incantation, which is characterized by one, the repetition of a falling cadence within a narrow range of pitch, Two, a flattened affect that suppresses idiosyncratic expression of subject matter in favor of a restrained, earnest tone. And three, the subordination of conventional intonation patterns dictated by particular syntax and of the poetic effects of line length and line breaks to the prevailing cadence. I'm, I'm, I'm reading this on purpose because I want you to understand that the machine cannot do that stuff, right? That, that is still up for the, the humanist to do. Um, but the, the kind of intervention that we're, try that we're trying for here is to um, facilitate and to activate that kind of scholarship. The last example I'm going to show you is um, a little bit, uh, we're still sort of wrangling results out of this, the supercomputer, so it, it trickles in at me occasionally. Um, but what we were interested in the context of folklore at the Dolph Briscoe Center is looking at patterns of when people are singing, as I said, when there's instruments and when there's spoken word. Um, this is kind of a small collection, but it, it obviously this, this kind of analysis can be magnified um, a hundredfold at the Library of Congress and the American Folklife Center, um, the Lomax collection at the um, Association for Cultural Equity. They have all of Alan Lomax's recordings that he did all over the world. Um, that's, I think those are about 17,000 files. 
Um, this kind of analysis can be scaled up to look at those things. Um, what you see here is uh, predictive analysis again from the machine, but visualized instead of showing it to you in the spreadsheet. The blue is um, instrumental and the orange is spoken. So across time in this audio file, uh, essentially the machine is, is able to tell us, you know, it's primarily someone singing. However, what you can also see, if you sort of zoom in on the data a bit, you can see these points in the middle where the singing stops and someone, or the instrument stops and someone is speaking. And what's nice about that is, is and what we can start to think through is the kind of metadata that you can add to a collection at a, you know, time plot that says this is where speaking begins in this audio. This is, or, um, you know, this is where the instruments start. Um, that's hard to see, but this is um, an entire collection with tiny little plots for each of those things. And one thing that you can imagine, and, and, and archivists seem to like this idea, is a visualization of your audio file that shows you which ones are primarily instrumental or which ones are primarily spoken or which ones, you know, you, you name your element that you're trying to figure out in your audio. And it's just a different way to browse your audio, to know what's in it, to think about the patterns that you have in your collection. Ooh, this is a close-up, sorry, this doesn't, these things don't expand well. Um, but what you have here is, is blue is, is sung, green is spoken, and red is instrumental. Um, and some of these are for example, I know these are difficult to see, but uh, there's a lot of singing in these. These are the um, collections, the recordings done by John Lomax in the 30s and 40s. And primarily what you get is a cappella, which is the blue sung. Um, but what you can also see are some recordings where people are singing with instruments. The other thing that I wanted to suggest with this is that uh, you know once you can map metadata to this kind of analysis, what you can have then is an understanding of um, you know, the context of your entire collection. So this is a little film I took of, of data. This is all across the, um, the folklore collection that we have from the University of Texas. Uh, and what you see here is these numbers indicate, the, the yellow indicates uh, the number of seconds in an audio file when, when there's more singing. And the blue indicates the number of seconds in an audio file when there's more speaking. And each two blocks is one audio file. So these are the numbers in the audio files. And so this, this yellow and blue goes together, this yellow and blue goes together, this yellow and blue. It tells you how much of each of those things are in a file. At the top of the screen, there are dates. And so what I'm going to take you through is kind of the history of this collection from the 20s to the 60s. And you'll start to see a pattern with, um, the only thing you really need to remember in your mind as we go through this is that we're going forward in time. And the yellow is sung, and the blue is spoken. And you can start to see how those patterns change across the recordings in this collection over time. So that's starting with 1920, and then we'll start to go through time. Again, the yellow is sung. And now we're in 1950. And you start to see that it, it transitions, and there's more speaking in these files. and then it switches back, and there's more speaking again. Now that may or may not be of interest, but one of the things that I'm interested in is the concept of the interviewer and the interviewee and how that changes over time and how speaking has something to do with that. So if all you're interested in, um, you know, if you're John Lomax and primarily what you're interested in is recording the singing, of a particular community, um, you're not spending a lot of time talking to the people in that community and getting to know the sort of context 
of that collection. I think that relationship with the interviewee changes over time, and I think we can see that in a significant way in some of these recordings, but that's just something to think through a little bit more closely, but something that's indicated by just this kind of brief look at um, the audio. Uh, that work is going to show up in Sounding Out blog, which is doing, which I'm, I'm editing in a small, it's um, 100 years since Alan Lomax was born this year, 2015, and um, we're doing a small collection of blog posts in Sounding Out blog. And my, my hope is to get a little bit more data on the, um, on the collection of his father's before the end of the week so I can actually write my blog post. But if you're interested in that, in some of those results, then that will appear there. So I want to come back to, um, before I end, I want to come back to this idea of the rationale of audio text and then, and then a tiny cautionary tale and then I will be, I will be through. I know I'm standing here between questions and lunch. Um, so... What we discovered in part of our work is that, you know, what do, do we as in, you know, scholars and humanists talk about when we talk about sound? We talk about tempo and pitch and tone and timbre and dynamics and laughter and silence and emotions and um, changing speakers and that kind of thing. But what do uh, sound technologists talk about when they talk about sound? They talk about damping ratios and gain and frequencies and spectra and energy and pitch energy. So one of the, the driving questions in this is how do we make that crossover, right, between how we think about the world um, and, and what sound articulates and how sound is actually being articulated by, by a computational intervention. And now I'm going to end um, because... Everyone was so shocked that I didn't actually have a sound recording. Um, I'm going to end with a, whoa, a little bit of sound. Um, and this is an example of um, machine learning that I like to, like to sort of pull out, but it's also a cautionary tale. And what you'll see here are there are um, about 20 recordings that I've put into Arlo, and I've given it an example of a sound. And it happens to be William Carlos Williams saying, forgive me. And I happen to know in the collection that I also gave to Arlo that there are three recordings of, um, of, uh, of Williams reciting the poem, This Is Just to Say. And I've taken a little clip out of one of them and not telling the machine who the other ones are, I've said go find more like these because I know he says it in another two recordings in the small subset just because I wanted to see what Arlo would do. This also gives you an indication of how this kind of works on a really minuscule level. level. So these are the audios, the uh, files. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to show you in a second. This is the small clip that I pulled out. It's in green. And the results that Arlo is going to give me are in red. And this is the original recording. This is just to say, I have eaten the plums that were in the icebox and which you were probably saving for breakfast. Forgive me, they were delicious and so sweet and so cold. Forgive me. That's the piece I pulled out and said, go find more like these. And I got first. Judgment. Allen Ginsberg saying judgment. Brooklyn Act. Allen Ginsberg saying Brooklyn Act. Forgive me. And then another one of the recordings saying forgive me. And then I think it pulls up another Ginsberg and then another, another um, William Carlos Williams. Now the point here isn't to say that, that Arlo did a bad job. Right? The point here is to say that you know, judgment and forgive me don't sound that different if you're thinking about the rhythm of those words. You have to be careful, I think, with machines in knowing what you're asking of it before you can actually look at the results to say whether the results are good or bad. Right? Um, so that's, that's kind of my cautionary tale. The, um, the other aspect of that is where I'll finish. So our current funding that we got um, from the National Endowment of Humanities Preservation and Access branch was really to focus on, you know, what does this mean in the terms of archives? So we've, we sort of pulled away from the scholars. Scholars ask really difficult questions. So um, at this current round of funding, we're really trying to think through, well, what kinds of things can we ask the machine to do that archivists can use to, to create that level of access that we're asking for in these collections? So thank you. And a special thanks to um, my team, but especially Steve McLaughlin, who 
Harold's from here and um, a lot of the work that he did on the visualizations that you saw. Thank you.